Welcome to Electron Online, and now we're going to take a look at what we call Rayleigh scattering. Again, we're trying to figure out what a photon is. And a photon, part of sunlight as it enters the Earth's atmosphere, tends to scatter in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, why does it scatter? Well, there's different phenomena, different reasons why it scatters. One of them is what we call the Rayleigh scattering. And Rayleigh scattering is where sunlight, where we have relatively large photons, scatters over very small little particles called the nitrogen and the oxygen molecules in the air. Now, in relationship, size-wise, imagine that sunlight has a wavelength of 500 nanometers on average. So the lambda of sunlight is about 500 nanometers, and the typical length of a nitrogen or oxygen molecule is about 300 picometers, which means the wavelength of visible light is more than a thousand times the size of the particles that it scatters on. You say, well, wait a minute, how can it do that? It's this huge wavelength, this huge electromagnetic wavelength of when you take these the wavelength of these huge photons in comparison to the tiny little particles how can scattering actually happens is there a collision taking place and how can this big photon find that tiny little particle to scatter on well it's because scattering doesn't happen because there's actual collisions scattering happens because there's some electromagnetic interaction between the photons coming in and the particles so let's take a closer look here's a nitrogen molecule Nitrogen has five valence electrons in the outer uh, orbital, in the outer energy level, I should say. And so we have two, uh, two nuclei that are positively charged and ten electrons in total, six of them which must be shared in a valence, in a sharing uh, relationship. And then we have two additional electrons which can be in the outer orbitals of the individual atoms, forming a molecule like that. It turns out that this molecule is symmetric in all respects, so that the charges are symmetrically divided over, so there's no one side that's more positive and the other side that's more negatively charged, so there's an equal charge distribution in the molecules, perfectly symmetric. Same with oxygen, except with oxygen, we have four valence electrons here and only four being shared between the two. But the principle is the same, and so it turns out that these molecules can actually vibrate in various directions. So the molecule can vibrate like this, it can vibrate like this, but it's more likely to vibrate like this. And so when an electromagnetic wave or a photon comes along, and of course a photon, what does it do? It changes the electromagnetic field around these air particles, the air molecules for example, and it causes them to vibrate at the same frequency as the vibration of the electromagnetic radiation or the vibration of the photons which means that as the photons come through and they vibrate, the change in the electromagnetic field will cause the molecules in the air to vibrate as well at the very same frequency. Now they're more likely to absorb the energy in this direction than this direction, and since the molecules have all kinds of different orientations, you will then find that the scattered light, because what happens is a molecule will absorb the energy and then re-emit the energy without any loss, but it'll, it'll transmit the energy in this direction more readily than in this direction. And because of that, we tend to, the air tends to polarize the scattered sunlight. And so there's a certain polarization factor to it. But because of that, because of different orientation, here I have a little picture of it, a primitive picture I may add. So you have the sunlight coming in from the sun, it enters the Earth's atmosphere, and as it starts hitting these air molecules, it begins to scatter out, but more so in one direction versus other directions, so the light tends to get polarized relative to the direction of the incoming sunlight. Because of that, the, and also what we find is that the amount of scattering depends on the wavelength of the incoming light. It turns out that the intensity of the scattering, the amount of light that gets scattered, is proportional to one over the wavelength to the fourth power. It's kind of interesting. Let's explore that for a moment. So we know that the wavelength of sunlight goes, ranges anywhere from 400 nanometers for the purple light to about 700 nanometers for the red light. So this is for red light and this is for purple light. So which light gets scattered more? Well, it turns out that the shorter the wavelengths, the greater the scattering, the longer the wavelengths, the less the scattering. So it turns out that if there's a higher frequency photon with a shorter wavelength, it's more likely to interact with the um, air molecules, with the nitrogen and oxygen, more likely to distribute its energy into those molecules and get it re-radiated out so that the light no longer comes directly towards the observer, but that it's scattered in different directions. 
Part of the reason why the sky is blue is because blue is more likely scattered in this fashion because it has shorter wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths means higher intensity of scattering. And so therefore, the sky looks blue because blue light tends to get scattered out way more than red light. The reason why the sky doesn't look deep dark blue is because all of the wavelengths get scattered as well, but not quite to the same quantity. If you draw a little chart of that, and so you say uh, this is blue light at 400 nanometers, or purple light at 400 nanometers, and this is red light at 700 nanometers, the amount of light getting scattered out will vary like that according to wavelength. A much greater proportion of blue light gets scattered out and very, very few of the red photons get scattered out in comparison. Ratio-wise, let's take a look for a moment. Let's say that uh, we take 400 to the, fourth to the fourth power and we take 700 to the fourth power and then we'll take that ratio and see what we get. Actually, we don't have to do 400. We can go four by itself and get rid of zeros because we just want to care about the ratio. So four to the fourth power is 256. 7 to the 4th power, whoop, that's too many, 7 to the 4th power is 2,401. So ratio-wise, how much more the blue light gets scattered out compared to the red light? If we take the 2,401, because it's inversely proportional, so we have to take the inverse of that, so 2,401 divided by 256, what do we get? We get 9.38, 9.38, which means that blue light is more than nine times as likely to get scattered out in the atmosphere as red light, so a ratio of about nine to one. Now, part of the reason why not nine times as many blue photons get, get scattered out is because the distribution of light coming to the Earth doesn't have as much blue light as it has more of the yellow, green, and orange light. Anyway, so to get a feel for the uh, Rayleigh scattering, let's take, an, let's take a look at the equation right here. This is the equation that defines the Rayleigh scattering. Notice the 1 over lambda to the fourth factor in there. Also notice that it depends on the number of molecules in the air, of course, and how effective those molecules are at reflecting or scattering the light. So different molecules have a different uh, proportion in which they can scatter the light. Also, of course, the intensity is as uh, proportional to 1 over the distance squared. As you go farther away from the source, you get less and less of the intensity. And finally, we have the scattering angle theta right here. Notice that when theta is equal to 90 degrees, the cosine of theta goes to 0. You have a 1 there. If it's either 0 or 180, you get cosine of that is equal to 1. So you get 1 plus 1 equals 2, which means that the scattering in this direction is about twice as much as the scattering in this direction. And so that's, by definition, Rayleigh scattering. Again, understanding a photon is understanding how it interacts with matter. Here we have a photon that has a wavelength that's over a thousand times the size of an air molecule, yet there's the interaction because of the changing electromagnetic field that causes the scattering to take place. And hopefully that again gives us another window into the look of what a photon actually is. A photon is a piece of energy, and as it travels through or near charged particles, the interaction is not because there is actual collisions, the interaction is because the changing electric field inside the photon causes the interaction to occur as the charged particles pick up that change and transfer the energy from the photon to the particle and then can re-radiate that back out as the energy then gets put back into space in a different direction. So basically these, these uh, nitrogen and oxygen molecules become like radiating dipoles. It causes the, the, the electrons inside to vibrate according to the frequency of the photon and then re-radiate that energy back out. So they temporarily absorb and re-radiate out the energy of a photon. And so we have a photon coming in one direction, getting absorbed by the molecule, getting pushed out in another direction, goes on its merry way, same wavelength, different direction, and that's how photons get scattered in the Earth's atmosphere. Pretty, pretty ingenious way of making the scattering work.